Welcome back to part two of our question and answer session. Today, we're gonna to be tackling all of your burning questions about homesteading, how to get into homesteading, homesteading finances, gardening questions, food preservation questions, chicken questions. You guys sent me a list of some really great ones, so I can't wait to dive into them. And if you missed part one of the question and answer session, definitely check out that YouTube video. That one is a little bit more personal. You guys wanted to learn all about me and Ryan and if he works and how we even got into all this. So really just telling our personal story and all those details. But this one is gonna be more about helping you as you navigate your self-sufficiency and homesteading lifestyle. And I thought it'd be fun to answer those questions while doing a tour of our trails here. So we're gonna get into the woods and start chatting. So question number one is, what advice would you give someone who is looking to start a homestead? So my advice would be really sit down and think about your goals and what you want homesteading to look like because it looks totally different from one person to another and there's a big range of homesteading and we've been through the entire range. We went from urban homesteading in our small little city lot to a normal, I guess, homestead on five acres. That's typically what people are doing when you think about homesteading. And then we've gone to our full remote homestead on our 240 acres. So really think about what the homesteading word means to you when you're kind of thinking about where you want to buy land or what you want that land to do for you. So if you really want to get into grazing animals, you want to make sure that you have good pasture land. We're here in our dense woods not so much. Here we're really set up for hunting. And so if you're really looking for hunting as being your self-sufficiency strategy, maybe a wooded lot in prime hunting country might be a better fit for you. One other tip I have when searching for a homestead is absolutely take some time looking through your township monthly meeting minutes or their notes because every township is very different. Some might be super controlling with a bunch of rules and they're constantly going after people where other townships are super lax. They're just kind of like doing the bare minimum and don't want to get in people's way. So I think that is huge based on what you're looking for. If you are looking for, you know, a township that has a little bit more control and they'll be able to go to bat for you if there are issues, maybe go for a little more active of a township. But if you're just kind of wanting to do your thing and not have anyone get in your way, <laughs> then maybe going for a more relaxed township is key. So highly recommend looking into that. And that's public information. Every township, or at least in Minnesota, you can hop on their website and all their monthly meeting minutes are right there. But I think my best tip if you're new to homesteading and self-sufficiency is to start practicing now. I can't stress that enough. I think that is the ultimate most important thing to do because oftentimes people jump into it and they don't realize how much work it is. Definitely start practicing those skills now. So learn how to bake sourdough bread, start a garden where you're at. If your city allows chickens, go ahead and get those chickens. Learn how to chop wood, even just fixing things. Fixing things is turning out to be the most valuable skill. I feel like something is broken all the time, if not multiple things. So thankfully Ryan is really good at fixing things. Otherwise we would be in, in bad shape. So <laughs> learning all those skills is really gonna A, give you a taste for the homesteading and self-sufficiency lifestyle before you fully commit. And it'll also make the transition a whole lot easier. Cause if you're needing to learn all of those skills, oh, I fell in a hole <laughs> and get used to just living on a homestead and everything at the same time. That's just a big pill to swallow. So start the skills now, get a feel for it and decide if that's really what you wanna do. So this next question is kind of similar. Someone asked if you had to choose between gardening or chickens to get started, which one would you pick? And there's no right or wrong answer. It totally depends on you and what you're excited about. I think if you're really excited about one, following that passion is important. I'm also all about having a good self-sufficiency strategy, meaning focus on the things that are gonna help reduce your grocery bill the most. So if your family eats a lot of eggs, maybe chickens make the most sense for you, but I would say most people usually start with a garden. It's kind of an easier step. You don't have livestock to take care of. You can still travel and do all those things but either way is a good way to start. So next question, other than Minnesota, where would you want to homestead and why? That is a great question. Honestly, I feel like 
each place has its pluses and minuses. And I haven't traveled all that much. I'm kind of a homebody, so I haven't been to all that many states to really give you a sense one way or another. But I will say I went to Idaho last month for the Modern Homesteading Conference. And by the time I was leaving, me and my friend Abby were already on Zillow, just kind of looking around. Really like that state. It seems similar to Minnesota in that they get all four seasons, which is important to me, but there weren't any mosquitoes. So that was <laughs> uh, wonderful. So it's of course expensive to live out there, but man, Idaho seems really cool. So this next question I thought was really good. If you were single, would you still do this? And Ryan and I actually talked about this the other day, kind of morbid, I guess, but if something would happen to the other one of us, would we still stay on this property? And I think both of our answers would be probably not, at least on this property with 240 acres, it is a lot to manage, even with two people. And so if we were down to one, that would be really challenging. And we feel it if one of us leaves for something, the chore list gets a whole lot longer and you just kind of slowly get behind. But would I still homestead? Absolutely. I would probably just downsize significantly, live a little bit closer to town. But I think this lifestyle is important and achievable for anyone, whether you're single, you're young, you're old, it just may not be on a grand scale. So I would still, of course, have a garden. I would still have chickens. Those are easy. I would still be cooking from scratch. And if I can't produce everything, at least connecting with local farmers. So yeah, in a sense, absolutely. If I were single, I would still do this lifestyle just Maybe not quite to the extent that we're doing right now. I feel like this next question comes up a lot and I get it because land is expensive. So homesteading finances, how do you cover costs? So unfortunately, I wish I could tell you that just selling your extra eggs, you're gonna make a good profit and that's all you need to do. That it's pretty hard to make a decent income just from extras off your homestead. Yes, you could do a true production model and be basically a chicken farmer or have your own vegetable CSA, but that is a big undertaking. And my understanding is it takes several years even just to break even. So it's a, it's a big deal. It's not something to just quit your job and start tomorrow. And so with that, that's pretty much where Ryan and I are. Ryan still works full time, as you heard when we were chatting earlier, and I still worked as a dietitian until just a year ago. And now I'm still technically working, just more content creation. So we actually make minimal money from our homestead. It's all just outside work to kind of support what we're doing here. So as much as I would love to say, yeah, you can quit your job and just live off your homestead. That's not very true for most people. Now we are doing everything we can to reduce our need for money. So that's one of our big goals is to make our homestead set up in a way that we don't need very much money so that we can hopefully retire early and just enjoy living here, but we'll see. So next up are the gardening questions. We'll head over to the garden now, but I'll answer a few of our questions along the way. So have you always known how to grow a garden and harvest and preserve it? No, I think what a lot of people are surprised to hear from me is that I'm entirely self-taught. I didn't grow up doing these things. I just had a pretty typical suburban up Bringing. We had a couple fruit trees, but that was about it. No big garden, no food preservation. My mom did cook from scratch, but so she taught me how to cook, which is awesome. That was a big blessing that started me off right. But other than that, I've been 100% self-taught. And when I started in 2008, all these wonderful resources and content creators to follow didn't exist. So it was just me and books and a lot of trial and error. I made a lot of mistakes, but I learned a lot along the way and here we are. So how do you calculate the amount of plants that you need to feed yourself for the year? I love this question and I'm so glad that you asked this. You can find calculators online or people will, you know, put out stats on things you can follow. And while that's kind of a rough guideline, I feel like it's just too hard to put a blanket statement out there for each individual person because everyone's going to eat different types of vegetables, different amounts, and that specific vegetable is going to grow different for person A versus person B. And so it's just a learning thing for me. You just start with a small garden, see what does well, see what doesn't do well, and see what you eat the most of, what you wish that you had more of, and then plant more of that and less of something else because inevitably you'll grow something and you grew too much or you never got through it and then 
it was kind of a waste. So you just gotta keep good records and just go from there. So I keep, I actually have an ultimate homestead planner, which I highly recommend. I have, I'll have it linked in the description where you can keep count and be organized of everything that you're producing and kind of make note of when you ran out so that next year you can figure out, okay, what did I need a little bit more of? So there's no clear cut answer. You just kind of have to work through it. It'll be a few years. To be honest, we're still tweaking it <laughs> and I've been gardening for almost 15 years now. So, or has it been 15 years? So next question, and this is a good one. How do you figure out the plants or trees on your homestead if unknown? How did you learn what plants were beneficial or useful on your property? Yeah, so obviously since I'm self-taught, it's not like I grew up identifying all these things and just naturally knowing them. So largely books, I have a few favorite books. I'll make sure to link um, that in the description so you can kind of look through the group of books that really taught me everything I know. And then there's also a great app now that I downloaded a few years ago. It's called Plant net plant net and i think it's free and you can just upload a photo so if i've been using that a lot here on our new homestead i can upload a photo of something i find in the woods and it's pretty accurate so that's been really helpful but i definitely make sure i do my homework and i'm absolutely sure what a plant is before i start trying to make medicine out of it or eating it randomly so you really want to be sure <laughs> okay so we're back out at the garden which is perfect for this next question what are the most effective companion plantings for vegetables and herbs so i actually have quite a few blog posts on my website talking about companion planting so you can just go to my website and type companion plant and a bunch of different blog posts will come up but i will say that my universal companion plant for literally any vegetable or herb in my garden are calendula, marigolds, and nasturtiums. They are just wonderful. They're friends with everybody. They help repel pests. They bring in beneficial pollinators. And so I make sure to cluster them in around any of my plants that are problem plants, like the brassicas. They typically can get hit by that pesky cabbage worm. And then also I put it around my zucchini to try to ward off that squash vine borer. Other than that, there are specific pairings of certain vegetables that shouldn't be planted near each other or that should be planted near each other. And I could talk about that for an hour. So, so make sure to head over to my website to check that out. Also, one of my favorite gardening books, which will be in that link of book resources, gives you a great table of all of it. So that's essentially what I follow. So next question is, what do I still need to purchase as a homesteader who practices self-sufficiency? So are there still things that I need to buy? So yes, even though we love to be self-sufficient, we are not 100% self-sufficient. I'd say we're maybe 70% and I'm okay with that at this point. I think over time we'll slowly get up there, but I have no plans to be 100% self-sufficient because I still enjoy going out and connecting with people and bartering with people. And I think just building that community is important. So for now, we do meat chickens, which are in here. We have a bunch of the eggs from the egg layers in there. Of course, all of our produce. I pretty much never buy produce year round. Even in the depths of winter here in Minnesota, I preserve and pack away most of what we'll need. We also go hunting, so we get venison from that. And then for fruit, we have fruit trees. We also have a bunch of just wild berries on our property. So blackberries, raspberries, blueberries. So we're good in the fruit department as well. So really the main things that I still buy is a little bit of beef, a little bit of pork, and then we do purchase grains. So I'm not growing grains yet. That is something that I hope to get into in the future. I don't have space for it right now. This garden is full and I don't plan on expanding it because we will be moving further back. We'll have to put in the new garden all over again. So there's no sense in really bumping that out. But I think that is what I'm gonna turn this space into. So once I move my garden back to our forever home, I think this space I'm gonna utilize for maybe growing grains. We'll see. Okay, last question about gardening. How do you preserve to maximize nutrients and ease of use when cooking? So I like to do a little bit of everything when it comes to preserving. So I don't like to put all my eggs into one basket. So when it comes to food preservation, there's pluses and minuses of everything in terms of ease, in terms of effort in preserving it, and then nutritional quality as well. So the best one for nutritional quality is fermentation. It's actually the only way 
to preserve something in which it increases the nutritional value. So actually nothing is lost. It's only, you only have gains, which is really cool. But I don't know if you're like me, but I like ferments, but it's not the only thing I wanna eat in terms of vegetables all year and all winter. So I do some fermenting. I love it as kind of a garnish, a side item. I'll just grab a few forkfuls here and there, but it's not my bulk form of food preservation. So the next best in terms of ease and nutritional preservation is freeze drying. I just got a freeze dryer last year and it has been awesome. So that has been kind of a newer thing for me to experiment with and it's been really great and I definitely plan on doing more and more of that this year. It's been really easy to rehydrate the food back. I love that it has a 25 year shelf life. And so I don't kind of have to be in a panic to eat it all up before the next year. So I still have a bunch of freeze dried food and it's good. I don't have to worry about eating it right away. In fact, I'm kind of saving it for survival food, I guess. And if you're interested in getting a freeze dryer, I do have an affiliate link. I'll put it in the description. I would so appreciate it if you wanted to use that. And then there's canning, pressure canning and freezing. And I like to do a little bit of both. I like freezing because it's easy. It's less of a mess and I have a vacuum sealer, so that's pretty slick, but it's not a good survival strategy per se, because if the power goes out and your deep freeze goes out, your frozen produce could be toast. So I do like how shelf stable canned goods are. So all that to say, I do a little bit of everything. Okay, I think that's the bulk of the garden questions. So next let's move on to chickens. So the first question is about our meat chickens. So I was asked how many we raise and if that's enough for us year round. So typically we raise 23 red rangers and that's enough for us for the entire year. So that's roughly about one chicken every other week. And again, it's just the two of us, so that's plenty fine. But we are a little short this year because we've had some crazy rain really for months. And one night we had an epic downpour when these guys were about two and a half weeks old. They were dumb enough to stand in this corner where there is no shelter and they basically got wet and cold and we lost six of them, which is a bummer. We've never had that happen before. We've been raising meat chickens. I think this is our eighth year, ninth year, something like that. And there's a first for everything. So we're down to 17. So with that, we'll either have to really milk it and depend on our other meat sources, like hopefully getting a few deer this fall, but we might have to partner with some local farmers to get a few extra chickens this year. Whew, feels nice to be in here in the shade. It's, we're finally getting into summer weather. We've broken 80 degrees and I'm not used to it yet. <laughs> getting hot. Okay, another chicken question is how do we train the dogs to be around the chicken? So that is a big one. We have had four dogs now, James, rest in peace, but then we still have Roxy, who is an old pro by now, and then our two newest dogs, Benny and Tucker. And Benny was so easy. He just really wasn't interested, so we didn't have to do much, but the three other dogs, they absolutely wanted to eat the chickens, and it was a process. So my best advice and what really worked for us is a gradual introduction and not making the chickens a big deal. So the last thing you wanna do is bring the dog up and be like, oh, do you see the chickens? Do you see the chickens? Don't do that. We don't wanna spark interest. We just want to have them around and just get used to the chickens also being around and just being no big deal, part of the family. And so we started with the chickens completely locked up and that's where having a covered cozy run is really helpful. You could leave them in here for weeks, months if needed until you're really sure that your dog is ready for the next phase. So I would just walk by the coop you know, every day, a few times a day with the dogs and just walk by. And if they kind of hyper-focused on the chickens, I would just kind of correct them, just be like, nope, nope, let's move on and just keep walking until they finally just kind of got bored with the whole thing. And once they're bored and not really hyper-focusing on the chickens anymore, then it's time to let the chickens out and have the dog on a leash. And so I, for weeks, especially with Tucker, he was very interested in the chickens. For weeks there, I would have the chickens out loose and we would just do walking passes, walking, walking, walking with him on a leash. And if he kind of started to lunge or go after them, I would just give him a little correction and be like, nope, we're gonna keep walking. And eventually he just got it and got over it and then the last phase, if you have a training collar, highly recommend it. Our dogs have GPS collars just so we can keep track of them out here, which has saved the day so many times. 
but it also has a little correction thing that you can use. So that was my last phase. So I actually never had to use it. Thankfully, he kind of figured it out by then, but it was nice to have that backup. If I happened to see him go after a chicken, I could kind of give him a little, little reminder. <laughs> so I'm not a dog trainer, but that's worked really well for us. Next question is how I combat rodents around our chicken coop. So to be honest, I've never really had a rodent issue. I think a lot of it is because we have three outdoor cats and they are very avid mousers. So that really helps. And I always recommend leaving your food. Hopefully you can see it there. That's my feeder right there outside in the run. So don't keep it in the coop because then yes, you'll have rodents in your coop. So leave it outside covered run so that doesn't get rained on and then cats. Next question is how I integrate chicks, teenage chicks in with the adult hens and a rooster if you happen to have one. So we just finished the process. They are all officially free as of today actually, but I talk a lot about the process in my chicken coop tour video. I'll link that in the description so you can see it in detail. But basically I start the teenage chicks in our little chicken tractor. That way the hens can walk up to it and get used to the baby chicks and be like, oh, hi. And then everyone gets locked in here together for at least a week, a week and a half. And then something I added on this year is I put electric poultry netting to create an outdoor playpen so they could kind of keep graduating out and get more space and the chicks are still kind of getting used to coming back here at home because the last thing I wanted to do is just kind of let everyone out and then the baby chicks don't know to come back at night and they go get lost in the woods or something and that would be awful. So baby chicks now or teenage chicks now know this is home, they're coming back, everyone's used to each other. So far so good. And the last question cracks me up because I ask myself that question a lot. And the question is, you have a lot of laying hens. What do you do with all of the eggs? Yes. So we have 20 laying hens and we have a bunch more babies that'll start laying this fall. And it's just the two of us. And so that's a lot of eggs for sure. So I have a few things. One is I use them for bartering. And so I will go get raw milk with them or whatever else that's worked out really well. I also gift a lot to my friends and family. If they come and visit, I'll, I'll give them a few dozen. And it's also a great thing for pets. So we do quite a few eggs for our dogs to cut down on our feed bill and they love the eggs. So we do that. And then I also water glass quite a few of them in the summertime because we have a long winter and laying really slows down or halts. Sometimes I'll just get one egg a day for months at a time. And so I pack away a lot of those summer eggs to enjoy in the winter time. Water glassing is our ultimate favorite there. Well, this was so fun. It was so great to hear what questions you guys had and talk through it. If you send in some questions, thank you for doing so. I think you guys had some great questions and yeah, I hope that helps you get to know me and Ryan and our place and our dreams a little bit better. And it's just been awesome to have you guys along for the journey and make sure to subscribe if you aren't already and I'll catch you on the next video.